She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another coffee and crime time. And today, as you can tell from the thumbnail and from the title, we are finishing up the evaluation of the three-part Peacock so-called docu-series, Where the Truth Lies, which is Casey Anthony's magnum opus. And during these three episodes, Casey Anthony has done the very most with the help of these producers, to gaslight us and convince us that what we've seen with our own eyes and what we know with our own brains is not the truth. Only with Casey does the truth lie. And she's finally found us, the general public, to be ready for the truth, which, don't forget, only lies with her. Because there was so much garbage said in episode two, I couldn't finish the episode in the last video, especially because the episode did switch gears very quickly, started talking about the forensics. And, you know, that's very important stuff, although you wouldn't know it from watching this episode because they spend a total of like 10 minutes talking about this very important forensic stuff that they call junk science. So I did want to give it the detailed discussion that it deserved because Casey's supporters like I said, have called a lot of what was used against her during the trial junk science. And that is a convenient label to put on something that you don't agree with. But can they prove it was junk science? I certainly hope so. Because before Casey's trial even began, she was in court in March of 2011 for something called a Fry hearing. And for those who don't know, a Fry hearing is basically a chance for the judge in a trial to make sure that the evidence that's being used during the trial is accepted by the scientific community. And if it's not accepted by the scientific community, then the defense could use the fact that it's not accepted to have it excluded from the trial. So keep in mind that everything that you saw in Casey's 2011 trial was accepted by the scientific community. Casey's defense team did request that several pieces of evidence be looked at during these hearings. And like I said, that evidence we know was allowed into trial and passed the test of the scientific community. I guess that doesn't matter to anybody, you know, the, the whole like process that we have, because people just can't go and sit in a trial and say whatever they want when it comes to, you know, scientific claims, at least. You have to have a consensus amongst your peers in the scientific community that, yes, this is something we believe in. This is something we understand has value and merit in a, a legal trial sort of scenario. This means that any time you see an expert witness testify in Casey's trial, whatever they were saying had met the Fry standard and had been accepted by the court. I really shouldn't have to say much more than that, but I will. However, before we dive into that, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Helix Sleep. As I get older and busier and I have more going on, I find it harder to sleep for long sustained periods of time. I have to get up early, I'm getting to bed late, so I have come to focus more on the quality of my sleep rather than the quantity, and that's where Helix Sleep comes in. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs, and they conveniently ship everything right to your door with free shipping in the US. Uh, the mattress comes all rolled up in a box. It's incredibly simple to set up yourself, and also it's very cool to open this little box and have this like giant mattress on 
unfold from it. And really the key word when it comes to Helix Sleep is customized. Everyone's different and Helix knows that. So they've made a sleep quiz that you can take in just a few minutes to match your unique body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. For instance, I like to sleep on my side. I like a bit of a firmer mattress because I like to feel really supported. And I find that the softer my mattress is, the more I toss and turn. So Helix Sleep has something for everyone's taste. And if you sleep with a partner, you can actually take the sleep quiz together. How cute. And find the perfect fit for both of you. It may be the only time you compromise in your relationship, but your Helix Sleep mattress will make both of you very happy. It's been a few years now that I've been sleeping on my Helix mattress. And when I took the quiz back then, I was matched with the Midnight Lux model. And I have to say, it is as comfortable today as it was then. I feel that the quality of my sleep has really improved. I used to toss and turn a lot on my old mattress, but with my Helix mattress, I just sort of sink into this cozy yet firm and supportive hug, and then I'm down for the count. I can say I used to really not look forward to getting into bed at night, no matter how tired I was. I knew I wasn't going to have a comfortable night's rest, and I honestly thought it was me. I thought that, you know, I was just a skeletal and, like, muscular mess, and that I was just getting older and my back hurt all the time, but it turned out to be my janky mattress. And now, literally, I cannot wait to get into bed at night. I love to get into bed with the kids, read, you know, watch TV, watch a movie together. I really like doing that in bed now because it's just comfortable. And if it makes you feel nervous to buy something as important as a mattress that you haven't even touched, I have some great news for you. Helix Sleep gives you an entire three months to sleep on your new mattress. Jump on it, Netflix and chill in it, whatever you need to do, make sure it fits into your life. And if you don't 100% love it, they'll pick it up for you and give you a full refund. Plus, you will get a 10-year warranty and they offer flexible payment plans and financing options. I love my Helix Sleep mattress. I think you will too. If you're looking for a new bed and a better night's sleep, sleep, check out Helix for yourself. Click on the link in the description box below or go to helixsleep.com slash Harlow. If you do that, you're going to get up to $200 off your Helix Sleep mattress plus two free pillows. And let me say, their pillows are amazing. My husband took both of my Helix Sleep pillows and he gets really, really mad if I'm the one that makes the bed and I accidentally put his pillow on my side. So like I said, click link in the description or go to helixsleep.com slash Harlow, H-A-R-L-O-W-E, to get up to $200 off your Helix Sleep mattress plus two free amazing pillows. Thank you so much to Helix Sleep for sponsoring today's video, and let's dive in. Okay, so let's talk about the alleged junk science that was used against Casey even though she was found not guilty during her trial, and we're still going to pretend that in some way Casey was denied justice because... You know, she didn't serve any prison time for the murder of her own child. But most people don't believe her and don't like her, and that's wrong and unfair. Like, really, that's the end of the story. You know, it's not like this person went to prison for 20 years unfairly. You know, it's not as if she was prosecuted and charged unfairly. It's not like the jury made a decision to send her to the electric chair based on this scientific and expert testimony there's really no miscarriage of injustice here. Yet, Casey's pissed because we still don't believe her. She's entitled to everyone believing her and liking her because she's a narcissist. And so it's an injustice of some kind that we don't, although it's not actually, because she got away with it. She didn't go to prison. She was found not guilty. So why are we why are we talking about this, right? Well, it's just to, to add fuel to the fire. It's just to pile on. And like I said, they want you to think that there was junk science used. They want you to believe that some injustice happened. And um, they want you to kind of pay attention very quickly, because like I said, they don't spend a lot of time talking about this junk science. And they just want you to leave with the impression that like, oh, wow, everyone was against Casey. But the real injustice here is that you, Casey Anthony, had one job, literally one job, because you didn't have an actual real job. And your one job that you had was to protect your child and you failed to do so. The injustice here was done to Kaylee Anthony, not Casey Anthony, who legitimately was found not guilty so why are we talking about how the science in her trial was was wrong? She she wasn't found guilty. Like I'm I'm really clustered right now. 
And like I said in this episode, they go through the forensics and the science like quick fire, man. They don't spend a lot of time on any one thing. And that's done purposely, obviously. You know, we don't want to tell you the specifics. We just want to make these outlandish claims, show you a couple of things that look bad through the right lens and move on. So let's take some time and actually go over the physical evidence that was presented during the trial. One, we have human hair, human hair that was found in the trunk of Casey's car that exhibited signs of death banding. Now, the people in this docu-series won't call it death banding. They call it like hair banding or something. It's not called hair banding. It's, it's, it's not called hair banding. So during the trial, um, an FBI hair analyst expert testified that the darkened band at the root portion of the hair was a sign of decomposition, meaning whoever that hair came from had been dead. Now, because the hair that was found in the trunk of Casey Anthony's car had no root, they couldn't say for sure that it was Kaylee's hair because the root's going to have, you know, like skin cells on it where you can test. But they did extract mitochondrial DNA from the hair, which told them that the hair came from a female lineage of Kaylee. So basically either Kaylee, her mother Casey, or her grandmother Cindy. That's who the hair came from. One of those three people, only one of those three people is dead. Now, it's generally believed and accepted in the scientific community that not all hair from the head of a dead person will show this death banding. But if a hair does show death banding, it did not come from the head of a living person. Now, in this episode, Dorothy Clay Sims, a lawyer... Uh, who worked on Casey's legal team, she makes the statement that you can find death banding in all sorts of situations. You can even find it on living people, on the, the hair of living people. But then she gives no evidence and she says nothing else to follow up or support this claim. There are other causes for hair banding, not just that it came from a body that was already deceased. You can have hair banding even on people who are alive. Things like moisture and dirt, etc., can cause hair banding. And it really grinds my gears that people can just make these statements and then not actually give any evidence to, to support what they're saying. So here is a statement that I found in a 2002 study of postmortem root banding. Quote, thousands of cases have been examined by the FBI Laboratory Trace Evidence Unit and no hairs with this banding pattern have been reported in cases that are not associated with the death of an individual, end quote. So where is this evidence that anyone who is alive may have this death banding on their hair? And like I said, Dorothy Clay Sims consistently refers to this death banding, this post-mortem banding as hair banding, because that sounds better, right? Hair banding sounds benign and innocent. It sounds like something that could possibly happen and occur on the hair of a living person. But we aren't talking about hair banding. We're talking about post-mortem root banding. That's the literal, actual, technical name for what was seen on this hair. And why would that be the name for something when you can find that same post-mortem banding on the hair of a, a living person? It doesn't make any sense. Where are you getting your facts from, Dorothy Clay Sims? Like I said, both Casey and Cindy Anthony are still alive. Last time I checked, they were definitely still alive in 2008. And this hair found specifically showed no signs of being treated. Like the hair hadn't been colored or permed or anything like that. It hadn't been treated with anything. And reportedly, both Cindy and Casey have colored their hair, which strengthens the argument that the hair came from Kaylee. Also, they took hair from Kaylee's hairbrush and compared it to that hair and found it to be very much the same. Like, I forget how similar it was, but it was incredibly similar. And once again, this hair was found in Casey's trunk. Okay, so this is suspicious. This is not junk science. This is not something that just, you know, should be overlooked and not paid attention to. It is my opinion that Casey kept the dead body of her two-year-old child in the trunk of her car for at least a day. So when she was seen at Blockbuster with Tony Lazaro while she cuddled with him all night and watched the movies they'd rented, I believe, in my opinion only, that Kaylee's body was in the trunk of her car. Now, that's never been proven, but given her movements and given that it was a few days before Casey was asking her neighbor for a shovel, I personally think 
that's what happened. Now, moving on, we have the detection of decomposition in Casey's trunk. And this odor analysis was done by renowned forensic anthropologist Dr. Arpad Voss. And it was considered new and cutting edge at the time in 2011. Now, Dr. Voss, he's been studying this whole concept for years, and he was able to identify 424 compounds that are known to be associated with decomposition. And in the air of Casey's trunk, he claimed he found 41 out of those 424 compounds. An FBI lab also found levels of decomposition compounds in the air of Casey's trunk, as well as excessive levels of chloroform. Now, before Dr. Voss tested the air of Casey's trunk, a number of police officers had already agreed that the car smelled like death, as Casey's own mother and father had said, as did the person who, you know, worked at the car lot, as did the person who towed the car, as did anyone who got within a few feet of that car, not to mention numerous cadaver dogs who were specifically trained to detect odor from decaying bodies alerted to the back of the car. So like what I'm saying is, can we believe the cadaver dogs? They're not 100%, right? Can we believe the police officers who said the car smelled like death and they had smelled that smell before because they're police officers? Well, they're not 100% accurate either. Can we believe George and Cindy Anthony? Oh, I don't know. You know, they could just be wrong. Maybe they haven't smelled the scent of death that often. So can we believe this um, air sample that said there was compounds affiliated with decomposition in Casey's trunk? Maybe that's not 100% either. But all of those things put together, that stacks up to very, very heavy circumstantial evidence. Now, today in 2022, this odor analysis is not necessarily considered to be new and cutting edge, and it's not considered to be junk science. If the fact that this odor analysis got through those early trials, you know, the early trials where they wanted to make sure like, oh, is this okay scientific evidence to put into trial? Let's present it to the scientific community and peers of Dr. Arpad Voss and see if they agree that this is something we can use in trial. So it got through that. And it's also, you know, crazy, but it's it's the basics of how smell works. It's backed by actual science. It makes perfect sense. When we smell something, whether it's good or bad, we aren't sensing a ghost or, you know, something invisible. Even though the scent is invisible to us, it's invisible to our naked eye. But scent isn't this sort of like flimsy concept where it's like it's there, but it's really not. No, whenever we smell something, our nose and our brain work together to identify hundreds of very tiny molecules that are floating in the air. That's why when you go... And then you want to smell something in like, you know, your mom's making a delicious roast and you come in and you're like, mmm, let me get some of that roast smell, you know? That's because you're pushing the molecules into your nose and you're sniffing them in because you want to get more of them. You want to identify it. You want to take it in. So let's say your mom's cooking a pot roast and someone came in and grabbed a sample of the air from her kitchen in a lab they would be able to tell that you were cooking pot roast. They'd be able to tell that you were cooking carrots with that pot roast. They'd be able to tell that you used beef stock instead of chicken stock because of the molecules. So what's the difference between that, you know, a pot roast and the molecules from a pot roast and scientists being able to identify that you were cooking a pot roast because of the molecules and smelling a dead body and capturing the air where that dead body allegedly was and finding that the air has molecules that only a decomposing body gives off. It's not junk science, although it is very, very cool. And like I said, they said they found the presence of chloroform in the air. And uh, I don't really agree with this. And once again, there's a lot of things the prosecution did that I think they should have done differently. I think they wished they would have done differently. Based on this chloroform theory, the prosecution sort of put forth the idea that Casey Anthony had used chloroform to take Kaylee's life. And this was a theory developed not just by the air tests, but also by some internet searches that happened on the Anthony family computer in March of 2008, including 84 searches for chloroform, as well as searches for neck breaking and searches for household weapons. Now, in a stunningly hilarious and ridiculous turn of events, Casey's mother, Cindy Anthony, testified in court under oath that it was she who had searched for chloroform accidentally. She didn't mean to search for chloroform. She meant to search for chlorophyll. 
because she was worried that her little dog was eating bamboo leaves in the yard. Okay, But on the dates of March 17th and March 21st, 2008, when these searches happened, Cindy Anthony wasn't even at home. Cindy Anthony's username was logged in at the hospital where she worked as a nurse, meaning she wasn't home. She wasn't at the Anthony home or in the presence of the Anthony computer to make those searches. Even if we believed that she accidentally searched chloroform instead of chlorophyll over 80 different times, which we don't because that's ludicrous. Cindy also said that no one had searched neck breaking on the computer. She said a pop-up with the words neck breaking had been on her screen while she was searching for chlorophyll. (laughs) This just gets more and more ridiculous. But Computer expert Kevin Stenger testified that he not only found zero searches for chlorophyll on the Anthony computer, but the term neck breaking had been an actual search, not a pop-up, if we believed that neck breaking would be a typical sort of pop-up to occur, which we don't. But hold on, I'm not done, because after the trial, it was discovered that despite all of this incriminating evidence found in the internet searches, it got worse. And the detectives who'd been on the case, they completely missed an internet search made for suffocation. Not just suffocation, foolproof suffocation. And guess when that search happened? On June 16th, 2008, the day Kaylee Anthony died. USA Today reported that the sheriff investigators missed more than 1,200 searches because they'd been looking through the computer's internet explorer history, but they had not looked through the Mozilla Firefox browser, which was the browser more commonly used by Casey. Whoever Googled foolproof suffocation then immediately went on MySpace after the search. And who lived on MySpace? Casey Anthony. So Casey really liked to be on social media because she could control the narrative on social media. And honestly, that's why a lot of people like to be on social media. But we do understand that George Anthony wasn't on social media. He wasn't on MySpace. So keep that in mind. Yes, it was presented in court that Casey may have been trying to figure out how to make chloroform in order to kill Kaylee or to render her unconscious and then, you know, accidentally killed her. And the presence of chloroform in the trunk was not disputed by the judge who allowed it into trial because the way the prosecution experts had tested for chloroform in the carpet of the trunk was a method that had been used for 40 plus years in forensics. So they didn't just use this air test that Dr. Arpad Voss did. They also like caught a portion of the carpet and tested that and they found chloroform in that carpet. That's science that's been used for 40 plus years in forensics. So Arpad Voss is Dr. Arpad Voss, his air test just confirmed the presence of chloroform. So that's why that was allowed into the trial. Now, keep in mind, this chloroform could have been from a lot of things, the presence of this chloroform. Although I heard, you know, Dr. Arpad Voss said there was like a lot in there, but it could have been a lot of things. It could have been chemicals from, you know, the gases that the car gives off. It could have been chemicals from cleaning products that were spilled in the trunk, things like that. I don't know how much I believe this chloroform theory But like I'll say a couple of times throughout the series, I don't know how Kaylee Anthony died. I don't know why she died. I just know that she did die and that I 1 million percent believe that Casey Anthony was responsible and knows exactly what happened, whether it was an accident, whether it was purposeful, whether it was duct tape, whether it was chloroform, whether it was Xanax, which some people say. I don't know. I can't say for sure. And I don't have evidence one way or the other because By the time they got to Kaylee's remains, she was far too decomposed for them to figure out what her cause of death was. Maybe that was the plan of the person who convinced everybody for over a month that Kaylee was okay because if anybody had found Kaylee earlier, she wouldn't have been as decomposed. Her body wouldn't have been underwater during the rainy and wet season in Florida, and they would have been able to tell how she had died. But regardless... Let me just say again, I don't know. I don't know. I do know that the prosecution probably wanted to have some sort of theory to put forth. So they weren't just saying like me, like, we don't know how, why or when, but we know Casey did it. You know, they had to put something forward that was more um, tangible for the jury. I get it. 
but I don't I don't know how plausible that chloroform theory is. But let's say the prosecution was off and that wasn't the way that Kaylee died. Just because the prosecution didn't have the correct method of death doesn't mean that Casey Anthony is not responsible. This would be a different discussion had Casey been found guilty based on this evidence and testimony, but she wasn't, so why are we talking about it? And I would also say based on the totality of the evidence, a dead body was in the trunk of Casey's car. It wasn't just the smell of decomposition. It wasn't just the presence of chloroform. It was a lot of things. It was a paper towel that had been in the trunk of Casey's car that had a waxy substance on it, a waxy substance that was tested and found to be something called grave wax, which happens when a body decomposes and leaves behind fatty acids. And Casey's lawyer, Jose Baez, he brought up the possibility that the fatty acids could have been from leftover food or something like that, because, you know, Casey had like a couple bags of garbage in her trunk for a while. They want us to believe that when everyone thought they were smelling a dead body, they were actually smelling like an old leftover pizza that had been in one of these garbage bags in Casey's car. And we are supposed to believe that even the cadaver dogs were tricked by this cold pizza and they thought that this cold pizza was a decomposing body. But the prosecution's experts said, yeah, sure, I suppose this grave wax could have been from leftover food, but that leftover food would have to be meat. And that meat would have needed to have been really raw and have a high fat percentage, as well as contain bacteria that's usually only found in human bodies. I mean, I guess Casey may have had like Hannibal Lecter over for dinner. She didn't know what he was cooking for her. She just put the leftovers into the garbage bag, put them in her trunk. And, and how does she know that these leftover bags are just leaking grave wax from human bodies? I guess that could have happened. And then we have the coffin flies, which forensic entomologist Neil Haskell testified were attracted to decomposing organic material. Coffin flies, they're called. Postmortem root banding, grave wax, coffin flies. What do all three of those things have in common? They refer to something that comes from a dead body. Now, any of these things on their own, may be considered to be weak evidence, but altogether, I think they're pretty strong. So what do the biased people in this Peacock series have to say? They say there was no evidence that Kaylee had a chloroform in her system. And first of all, like I said, it was six months before that baby's body was discovered. And it took so long to find her because Casey told everyone for over a month that she wasn't missing. And then the rainy months in Florida hit and Kaylee's remains were underwater for a while. And because her remains took so long to find and were so exposed to the elements, you couldn't really determine much from them. Was that Casey's plan to put off any official search for Kaylee long enough that by the time she was found there, there wouldn't be a scrap of evidence on her, not fingerprints, not DNA, and they do make a big deal pointing this out, the lack of Casey's DNA or fingerprints on Kaylee. There was no DNA on Kaylee. Her remains had been flooded, picked over by animals, exposed to the sun and the rain and the wind. The absence of Casey's DNA on her own daughter does not make Casey innocent, but they really want you to pay attention to that part because they think you're stupid. They think you're like Rosie O'Donnell. And then the duct tape. What everybody saw in the news was, oh, the child's remains were found with duct tape over the mouth. No child deserves to die with duct tape around their face. Well, there was no evidence that that's the way they, that Kaylee died either. There was duct tape, some part, attached to her hair hanging down on the left side and the lower mandible on the right side. There was no DNA at all on the duct tape. How did it end up that way? Do I think that the duct tape could have come from the exterior of the bag? Absolutely. And in fact, there were witnesses that talked about how it could have slid down from the bag. To me, it was pretty clear that the duct tape had never, ever been on Kaylee's skin. That duct tape was not ever around her face when she was still alive. And they also want you to believe that the duct tape was never even on Kaylee's face. It was never even around her face. It was like on the garbage bag and then it got transferred to her face. And the reason for them saying this is because everyone really did focus on the duct tape, right? You can't say that your daughter accidentally died if she was found with duct tape over her mouth. Otherwise, it looks like you put it there after she was dead to support the story that she was abducted. I personally do think that's what happened. I I hope I hope that's what happened. I hope with all my heart that there was some drug involved and Kaylee just fell asleep peacefully. I hope with all my heart that 
Kaylee was not conscious to see her mother or someone else wrapping duct tape around her face, covering her nose and mouth, and then just suffocating to death and being aware of that. I hope to God that that duct tape was put on after her death. To protect myself legally, I will say that this is just my theory, but I believe that Kaylee died somehow, hopefully accidentally, and then Casey was like, oh shit, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I've got to come up with a story really quick. I'm going to say that Kaylee got abducted. And if they do ever find her body, I'm going to have to have something that makes it look as if she was abducted. And what says abduction? More than duct tape covering your mouth. I think that's exactly what happened. So I also don't agree with this uh, this docu-series where they're saying like, oh, that tape probably came from the bag, that the tape migrated from the bag that Kaylee was found in, and it was never even on her body. That is ludicrous. But listen, it's funny because during her 2011 trial, Dr. Warner Spitz, who we know, or if you've watched more of my videos before, you know, and I know from the Lindsay Parton trial, that dude will say whatever the hell he needs to as long as he's being paid. Allegedly, don't come for me, but I truly believe that. Dr. Warner Spitz said that the duct tape was placed on Kaylee's face after she died to hold her jawbone on, possibly because someone moved her body. We literally know that is bullshit, okay? But now the, the same people who were on Casey's defense team who used Dr. Warner Spitz as a defense witness— and Dr. Warner Spitz was like, oh, yeah, that duct tape wasn't put on Kaylee before she died. It was put on after she died so that somebody could move her body without her jawbone falling out. Because this was when Jose Baez was going after uh, Ray, was it Ray or Roy? Roy Cronk, the meter reader who found Kaylee's body um, and who had called it in. Because before they went after um, George Anthony, Casey's defense team went after Roy Cronk and tried to make it look like he had moved Kaylee's body and like hidden her so that he could wait for the award to go up or the reward for like information about her. And then when the reward was high enough, he called the police and was like, oh, I just stumbled upon this girl's body. Like that's so ludicrous. And then they just abandoned that, never talked about it again and started going after George Anthony. Do you see yet that Casey's defense team. They will do whatever it takes. They will throw shit at the wall and just wait to see what sticks. But regardless, we know that whole Warner Spitz jawbone tape thing is bullshit because forensic anthropologist John Skultz testified that Kaylee's body had been intact initially when it was dumped in the woods, but over time it was pulled apart and dragged by animals. But even then, the remains that had been there, they were there for a while because plant roots had grown through Kaylee's matted hair and portions of her skull. And her pelvic bone was found to be partially buried in sediment that suggested it had been underwater for some time. So the proof and the evidence is there that Dr. Warner Spitz is just totally ridiculous and will say anything as long as he's getting paid and that there's no actual supporting evidence for his claim. But that doesn't matter now because we're not even going to talk about the expert you use during trial to show that Kaylee didn't die from the duct tape being over her mouth. We're not going to talk about what he said. We're going to come up with a whole new theory about how the tape migrated from the garbage bag that, that Kaylee was placed in and somehow ended up on her, like, m trapped in her hair. And I'm going to tell you in a minute why I don't believe that for a second. So Dr. Jan Garavaglia, most likely known to you as Dr. G Medical Examiner, she was the person responsible for performing autopsies on suspicious deaths in Central Florida. And she performed Kaylee's autopsy. And she believed that Kaylee had been murdered, and she felt that the duct tape had been on Kaylee's face before her death because it was sort of, like, wrapped around her head more than once. Like I said, I don't think we will ever know exactly how Kaylee Anthony died. And I do think or hope at least the duct tape was placed there by Casey to support her abduction claims. But we know that Kaylee's skull was removed from the garbage bag and the laundry bag by animals. So are we supposed to believe the duct tape just went along with it? The duct tape that was taped to the garbage bag? And all three pieces, because there was three pieces of duct tape. One was nine inches, one was nine and a half inches, one was seven and a half inches. But the way they talk about the duct tape in the series, you would think there was only one small piece of duct tape, and it just sort of like transferred to Kaylee's hair 
from the bag that she was in. But are we expected to believe that three pieces of duct tape transferred? Come on. But they don't talk about that. They don't talk about there being three pieces of duct tape. The three pieces for me is a sign that somebody purposely put that duct tape there. They wanted it to be a lot of duct tape. They wanted it to look like somebody had kidnapped this child and put duct tape over her mouth. Or if the duct tape was placed there before Kaylee died, whoever put the duct tape there wanted to make sure that she wouldn't be able to remove the duct tape and get air into her lungs. So the three pieces of duct tape, to me, completely discount that claim. But you won't hear them talk about three pieces of duct tape. They just say duct tape, duct tape. And they act like it's just one little piece. But, I mean, they don't spend a lot of time on any of these pieces of evidence. They just bring it up and say, hey, that's not true. That's junk science. And then they never explain why it's not true. They never offer supporting evidence of why it's not true. They spend a total of 10 minutes on the forensic evidence, which they call junk science, because honestly, they don't want to spend too much time on it. They just want you to think it's suspicious and be outraged that the system would try to railroad Casey like this. Oh my God. At least for those 31 days. Shot girls, music dancing, yep. young people doing what young people are supposed to do. And I want to say that clearly. There's nothing wrong with young people being young people. Exactly. There's nothing with young people drinking and dancing and having fun. Thank you, Jeff. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing. Not when your but that's dead. not the life that Casey has because Casey is a mom. That's in the entire prosecution is, well, explain yourself. I mean, that's not the way a grieving mother's allowed to act. No, that's not the way a I grieving mother that. acts. I really hate the suggestion that anyone tried to paint Casey as this person. It's not true. Casey painted herself as this person because, I mean, she was this person. She did go to clubs. She did get her nails done. She did get a tattoo. She stole from her friends. She lied to her friends. She told everyone Kaylee was alive and well. Do we need to keep going over and over? These people who made this docuseries are so dumb, so dumb. If they think anyone is foolish enough to buy this, Painting someone as something they aren't means manipulating, playing with the evidence and the facts to suit a specific narrative, kind of the way this series is painting Casey to look like an innocent person, a victim, kind of the way they're ignoring some of the facts and bringing others to the forefront. The ones they want us to pay attention to are brought to the forefront. The ones they hope we never see and never think about are not talked about at all. Simply observing Casey's behavior and talking about what she did and saying it's not normal and that it suggests guilt is not painting Casey as anything. It's just like talking about what we see with our own eyes. And then this little gem here. In the court of public opinion, Casey was already guilty. It was the first trial by social media. The public was weighing in on this and I'm sure the prosecutors had to be reading what they were saying and, and tailoring what they were doing to what was coming in that's called projection. That's projection. That's what you're doing. This uh, Dorothy Clay Sims woman is on my last nerve. She says the prosecution, <laughs> I can't take it. She says the prosecution was paying attention to what the public was saying and tailoring their argument to that. And first of all, last time I checked, that's not illegal. Lots of people do that. Lots of defense teams and prosecution teams do that. Secondly, you have no proof that they did that because they were making that argument. The argument they made in the trial was the argument they were making from day one. The public just agreed with what the prosecution was saying, with what law enforcement was saying. And if anyone was tailoring their argument as they went, it was the defense team, you guys, Dorothy Clay Sims, and you still are. You've had 10 years to hear the grievances that the general public has with Casey Anthony. You've had 10 years to watch the culture shift to be more female-focused, to be more focused on feelings instead of facts, to be more forgiving to violent offenders because they went through something traumatic. And so you have tailored your argument to accommodate that hoping to gain sympathy from people who have literally gone through hell, from people who have genuinely experienced trauma, or just from stupid people who don't want to do their own research and say things like, believe all women, you are the ones who are trying 
to manipulate the situation. And honestly, I don't think any of you are above legitimately lying to our faces if it means making it seem like you were not the person who literally took a child murderer and set her free on the world. I'm sure that people like Dorothy Clay Sims and the rest of the people who were on Casey's legal team have not had an easy time of it. I'm sure they are judged and hated in some situations, which, I mean, I don't agree with. It's their job. But also, I'm not trying to be, like, friends with these people, so I understand that much. You know, like, I don't have a ton of respect for for people who know somebody is guilty and then, you know— like get them off, but maybe they didn't know she was guilty. Maybe they fell under her spell. I don't know. Either way, I understand that maybe there's a negative sort of connotation around you and you would like us all to believe Casey so that you don't get as much backlash so that people stop judging you as well. Of course I get it, but I don't think you're above lying to us in order to make that a possibility. I don't think Casey is above lying to us in order to make that a possibility. I mean, we know Casey's not. Okay, let's finally dive into the third and final installment of this heavily biased reality television series, the third episode, and it's titled What Remains. This is an episode that's an hour and 20 minutes long, but probably has two minutes of actual original content in it. During the 31 days, I genuinely believe that Kaylee was still alive. <laughs> My father kept telling me she was okay. I just had to keep following his instructions. It was like I was brainwashed. And it wasn't until much later that I started to really realize why. I wasn't the only one home. I'm not outright accusing him of murder, but it wasn't an accident. <laughs> the pool. And already, right off the bat, we have this very odd statement. Honestly, a statement that uh, doesn't want to take responsibility for anything. A statement that wants to say whatever it wants to say, but not get in trouble for saying whatever it wants to say. It's kind of like how I say things and then say, allegedly, that's just my opinion, don't come for me. Um, You know, Casey's basically saying about her father, George, I'm not outright accusing him of murder, but it wasn't an accident. At least it wasn't an accident in the pool. Even though during your 2011 trial, you said it was an accident in the pool. But I guess now that you used that story in order to get acquitted, you can say whatever you want because we can't put you on trial again. That would be double jeopardy. And I do want to say, going into the first few minutes of this episode, I can confidently agree that Casey does seem to have a lot more emotion in this episode. And I think that it's true and real emotion. But as always, that true and real emotion is reserved for herself. It's reserved for the outrage and anger she feels about what happened to her, how she was treated, the alleged injustice that she feels she suffered through. She talked about Kaylee for roughly eight cumulative minutes during episodes one and two. She tried to force out tears while she was speaking about Kaylee, but you can tell Her emotion is much more genuine when she speaks about her own experiences because she is and always has been self-centered and self-serving. And to her, it's a true outrage that she was even looked at sideways when it came to this. She feels entitled to behave badly and not have anyone talk about it because that's how she was treated her entire life. Her entire life growing up, she behaved badly. She lied and no one talked about it. Her parents pretended it wasn't happening. Now, pop quiz, is that their fault or her fault? The, The really easy, quick answer is both, but still also hers. My life was literally hanging by a thread at that point. My potential of any kind of future hinged on the decision that those 12 people made. Casey, take a moment and explain what it feels like to be at the center of that. I, I don't, I'm rarely at a loss for words. This is, this is one of those moments. Mm-hmm. I can't describe to you how it feels, except to say I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. I wouldn't wish this upon any of the people who were trying to kill me or any of the people who would be watching this and still thinking that I'm guilty. I wouldn't wish this upon anyone, ever. (laughs) That's how bad it is. For someone who didn't have any words. This is what hell feels like. You found Is what I was put through for those three years. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The balls. The audacity. Casey says that this is what hell feels like. She wouldn't wish this on anyone, what she lived through those three years. Even us 
watching this. This is what she says. Even the people watching this who don't believe me, I wouldn't wish this on them. Why would you? Why would you? Why is us not believing you some serious affront to you? Why is that doing you harm? It's not. Okay, so she wouldn't even wish that on us, the people who don't believe her, who apparently are like her worst enemies. She doesn't say like, oh, I wouldn't wish this hell on like the, the worst murderers out there. I wouldn't wish this hell on the, on the monsters out there hurting people. It's like, I wouldn't wish this on the people who aren't on my side. Because those are the worst people ever. (laughs) Like, literally, she tells you who she is. She tells you her thought process without even intending to. She doesn't realize that everything she says sounds so selfish, so narcissistic, and so self-centered. To Casey, the worst people in the world are the ones who aren't on her side. That's very telling. And it's also very telling that she talks with such real and raw emotion about the hell that she lived through. But what did Kaylee live through? Can Casey reflect on the fear and sadness that her daughter felt in her last moments? Kaylee didn't have the luxury of living another three years. She didn't have the luxury of living a full and complete life. She didn't get to sell pictures of herself for money or sell lies about her own life and death. Oh, dude, and on that note, I just read a comment from the first episode yesterday because the second episode of this um, series hasn't gone up yet. Like, at least my talking about the second episode hasn't gone out yet. But someone said, like, I'm so sick of this, like, misinformation about Casey selling pictures of her daughter for monetary benefit. She didn't make that money. It went to her legal team. That's the same thing, right? Casey didn't sell the pictures of Kaylee and then the money was paid directly to her her legal team. Like she would have had to have received that money at some point and then paid it back out to her legal team. One way or the other, she financially benefited from it, right? She would uh, otherwise have had to have gotten a public defender. And then, you know, maybe she wouldn't have had such a great defense. She wouldn't have had, you know, slick Jose Baez over here just throwing theories at the wall and confusing the shit out of the jury for freaking weeks. Casey sold the pictures got the money, and benefited financially from the selling of those pictures. It's the same thing. We're like semantics at this point. And when we get caught up on semantics, that's when we really have failed as a society. There has to be a certain base of what we all agree on so that we can live together and have productive discussions, right? And we can all agree on on certain core concepts. And one of those core concepts is it doesn't matter if you paid the money out to somebody and no longer have the money, if you at one point had the money (laughs) and then you paid for something that benefited you, you financially benefited from that money, okay? For someone who's made a living off of her dead daughter, Casey Shore doesn't talk about Kaylee all that much. And now we have the moment they're talking about in the series, the moment that Casey is found not guilty during her trial. Remember, not guilty. She wasn't found innocent. They are two different things. But Casey wants you to believe that a jury found her to be innocent. That's what she says. She's like, finally, I, I was able to you know, revel in my innocence. I was found innocent. It's not true. They found her to be not guilty. But once again, she and the documentary makers are hoping that you are too dumb to know the difference. And you're not. OK, you're not. Not guilty does not mean innocent at all. It just means there wasn't enough evidence to find you guilty and people didn't feel comfortable sending you to death row with the amount of evidence that was presented. And look, just look at Casey's face when the verdict is read out loud. Madam Clerk, you may publish the verdicts. He's like, I can't believe this stupid jury made this decision. (laughs) As to the charge of first degree murder, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. You see that little smile she had? She wanted to smile so hard. And she was like, no, As don't smile. Aggravated child abuse. You gotta, you gotta look sad first. You see this? Did the jury find the defendant Holy not guilty? Shit. Go back. All right. Get As to face. the charge of first degree murder, we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Oh, yeah. She almost smiled there. Almost. Big smile. Almost. She's like, oh, As just to the charge be of sad. Aggravated Jeff, child Jeff abuse. Ashton's like, I can't even believe this. Be the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Uh, another almost smile, but you're like, nope, don't look too happy because your daughter's still dead. <laughs> we have this. Don't forget your daughter's still dead. Massive team embrace. Ugh. Massive team embrace. They saved my life. Yeah, they 
did. After three years of no dread and sadness, Ew. finally, gross, 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 gross. they proved my innocence. Oh, the, no, they did not. They proved that they couldn't prove you were guilty. That was the beginning of Casey's <sighs> carefully constructed coping mechanisms, just cracking and slowly falling apart. Oh, shut up. That hug. She wanted, she wanted to smile. She wanted to put on one of her big shining smiles of charm and success. And then she was like, no, no, Casey, you can't smile because remember, this isn't a win. Remember, your daughter's still dead. This isn't a win. It's just what you rightly deserve. You never, ever should have been sitting in this courtroom to begin with. So what kind of face would someone who was on trial unjustly, what kind of face would that person make? Make that face, Casey. She literally, she's like, they're like, oh, not guilty. And she's like, hmm, hmm. It's so ludicrous. And now, even though Casey Anthony slid away from a murder conviction on the trail of oil that her slick attorney left behind for her, her defense team, they were still afraid for her life. Casey lied to everyone for over a month and told everyone her daughter was fine and alive, and yet she's still a victim. Casey went on trial for murder, rightly so. She's still a victim. She gets acquitted. <laughs> but the public isn't happy about it, so she's still a victim. It's exhausting. Exhausting. I remember in this um, series, Dorothy Clay Sims is like, well, I was moving to France. And so I said, well, Casey can come and live with me in France. But then, you know, because she had a felony, you know, from lying to the police about her daughter being missing or not missing for 31 days, lying to the police about her daughter being abducted by somebody named Zaneda because she had this felony. She couldn't move to France. Yo, do you guys in France know that Dorothy Clay Sims... Tried to bring Casey Anthony to your country? How do you feel about that? And Dorothy Clayson is over here like, oh, yes, I was moving to France. Like, and in my, like, weird, don't, I'm, I'm just going to be a bitch. I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about her anymore. She grinds my last nerve, this woman. Okay? Whew. Okay. So let's move on. Now we hear the story about how Casey Anthony came to live with Pat McKenna. And when I first watched episodes one and two, I, I sort of found myself feeling bad for Pat McKenna. But we'll talk about that in a minute because I don't really feel bad for him anymore. But anyways, in Pat's words, maybe it's the Marine in me, but you don't leave the wounded behind because Casey's the victim. Still, she's the wounded now. <laughs> can't stand it. Who are these people? What did you do to them, Casey? Let them go. Like, is this some, like, Death Eater, Voldemort, like, brainwash curse, man? Was Casey Anthony's entire legal team put under the imperious curse to the point where they literally can no longer speak for themselves? They're just, like, automatons walking around, like, Casey is a victim. Casey, poor Casey, she is the kindest, sweetest girl I have ever known. Stop. Now, here's my question, because this may be pointless and petty. And like, listen, it has probably nothing to do with Kaylee's death. But I, I do notice something. I notice these patterns. Has Casey Anthony ever had to take care of herself? Nope. She lived with her parents. They paid for everything, including her daughter Kaylee's food and clothes and diapers. George Anthony built Kaylee's playhouse in the backyard. Cindy and George Anthony cared for Kaylee when Casey was off pretending to have a job. Casey stole money from her parents and her grandparents. And then when she left the Anthony home, she moved in with her boyfriend Tony. And from there, she stole gas from her parents and stole her friend Amy's money to go on Target shopping sprees. Then she lived in jail for three years, so the taxpayers took care of her. Thanks, everyone. And then after the trial... She was this wounded little doe in the woods, and Pat McKenna took her in. Now listen, I'm not saying that Pat McKenna is a bad person. On the contrary, I think he is or started out as a soft-hearted, kind person who is the prime personality type for Casey to manipulate and take advantage of. Casey always has to be under the care of somebody. She always has to be someone's ward. She's never been independent a day in her life. Nothing is her fault. Nothing is her responsibility, not even herself. She cannot be responsible even for herself. She lived with Pat. She works for Pat. Everything she has, she has because of someone else. And that's no way to live, man. Not as an adult. You can't have self-respect like that as an adult. You can't have that much red in your ledger, man. And you can tell Pat feels very 
protective over Casey. He calls her a kid. He keeps saying, like, oh, I couldn't leave this kid out to dry. Like, oh, this kid, this kid. She's not a kid. She's not a kid now. She wasn't a kid when her daughter went missing. She wasn't a kid when she went on trial. She wasn't a kid when she moved in with you, okay? Um, not at all. But he feels very protective over her. And he said, like, you know, she's she's a part of my family and she's, like, a daughter to me. Ugh, poor Pat, man. And in this clip right here, it cracked me up. Sorry enough. <laughs> with the approval of my family, I brought her to my house. Everybody agreed, and I said, I'm going to provide a year's worth of safety for this kid. You're so allergic to bees, right? <laughs> why? Yeah, why? For bees? Uh, yeah, why? <laughs> She's like, can I harness this bee? I tell you what, man. I am allergic to bees. <laughs> and if I was sitting across from the table from Casey Anthony and she asked if I was still allergic to bees, like, first of all, that, that doesn't go away, idiot. You don't just, like, wake up one day not allergic to bees. But if she asked, I'd be like, this chick's planning to kill me so she can, like, live in my house without me. She's just waiting for me to put her in that will, like some Anna Nicole Smith situation. Like, why are you asking him if he's still allergic to bees? Even Pat's like, why? Why do you ask? You know, he double took, man. Any normal person asking, hey, are you still allergic to bees? You'd be like, yeah. You know, of course I am, idiot. Like I, I'm always going to be allergic to bees, you know? You would say that, but because Casey Anthony asked Pat, was he still allergic to bees? He's like, why? Because there's even some part of him, I believe, some grain in his mind that's screaming at him like, Pat, 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 run, run, run. I'm pretty sure that was your 67th. I could look back. He's the guy that would walk me down the aisle if I was ever dumb enough to get married. <laughs> He's the closest thing to a real dad that I've ever had. Wow. Okay, Casey, you mean if anyone was ever dumb enough to marry you? Like I said, at this point in the episode, I felt sorry for Pat McKenna. I really did. And I do feel like at this point he's so brainwashed that he wouldn't want me to feel bad for him. He'd be like outraged, like, how dare you feel bad for me? I am on the side of the right. But I still did feel bad for him until we got further in this episode. And then I was like, yo, Pat, you are the problem. You are one of the problems. Um, he talks mad shit about George Anthony, but I want to say to I want to say to you, Pat McKenna, if you're watching this, you are you're part of the problem. You're enabling Casey as George Anthony did, as Cindy Anthony did, as Lee Anthony did. You're enabling her as everybody in her life had done, which is why she was who she was, which is why she found herself in bad situation after bad situation, which is why she found herself in the situation she was when she met you. Okay, so now we have Clint House pop on the screen, and let me tell you, Clint House and Cameron Campagna, they were uh, roommates of Tony Lazaro, and honestly, I've never put too much stock in what either of them had to say. They served one purpose and one purpose alone. They were able to see Casey Anthony in those 31 days because they lived with Tony, so they were able to see Casey, and they were able to see that she was acting like a person whose child wasn't missing. She was acting like a person whose child was fine and alive and well and a person who knew that. She was acting like a person who had not a care in the world. They were able to testify to that. That's all I needed them for. As far as what they think happened, I don't care because who are you? <laughs> you you aren't anybody that I need to be paying attention when it comes to what you think happened. Honestly, I don't think that this Clint House individual is that intelligent. I think that he probably allegedly did some some drugs, maybe some hard drugs back in the day, maybe a little ecstasy, maybe some acid, maybe some mushrooms, and and maybe, just maybe, he's kind of, you know, just floating by now. I also think there's a potential and a possibility that that Clint House and Cameron Campagna, they probably are just, you know, excited to be included in this docuseries, so they're going to end up saying and doing whatever. But let's talk about that in a minute, because I'm really disgusted with these two individuals, to be completely honest with you. The Cameron and uh, Clint, they both said, like, listen, we saw her in those 31 days. There is not a thing you can say to convince us that she's innocent. And so you hear them saying this in the docuseries. And when they said this, I said to myself, this is leading somewhere. They aren't going to let these guys legitimately 
say what happened. They aren't going to let these guys legitimately be like, yo, she's guilty of sin and you'll never change my mind. They are going to segue it into something. They're going to segue it into some like crazy conspiracy allegation that's going to completely discredit these two people. Or they're going to segue it into Clint and Cameron at the end of the day being like, oh, we do think that Casey's innocent. You convinced us. I didn't know which which one it was going to be, but I knew it was going to be one of them. And it ended up being both of them. <laughs> awesome. So through Clint and Cameron, we have the introduction of the Zanny the Nanny equals Xanax. And listen, I know even now there are a lot of people who still subscribe to this theory. And honestly, I can't blame you. I see it in my comment section. People really believe that uh, Zanny the Nanny was like a code name for Xanax. And so Casey gave Kaylee Xanax and gave her too much Xanax. And, and then she died. But personally, I never once believed it, and I believe it even less now, knowing that they're talking about it in this docu-series. See, here's my pattern for me, or at least my formula. If Casey addresses something directly in this series, it's a red herring and a dead end because she can confidently say, this is bullshit, and then show all the ways that it's ludicrous. So by default, those are watching who don't know the details of this case will say, oh no, this poor girl was railroaded, lied about, they made up these stories about her. This Xanax story is ridiculous. Ridiculous. So the rest of the allegations must also be ridiculous. That's what they're hoping happens, right? I fully believe that Kaylee was overdosed with Xanax. Did you ever give Xanax? No. Kaylee. I never gave Kaylee anything other than cold medicine when she had a cold. That was some concocted bullshit story, whether by the media or someone affiliated. <laughs> Trying to piece things together that don't fit into anything because they don't exist. None of that is real. I never saw Casey with Xanax. I never saw her give Casey or Kaylee any Xanax. But just the fact that Zanny the nanny was said just sent a light bulb off from my head. So that was Clint House, one of Tony's roommates back in the day. I don't know a lot about Clint, who he is, but I know a few things from watching this portion of the episode. One. This kid nefariously or otherwise made some off-the-wall connection between Zanny the Nanny and Xanax and, you know, kind of went on to put it, push it out, like went on and did interviews and stuff, basically causing others to jump on board the Zanny the Nanny equals Xanax train. Now, we know logically that Casey got the name Zanny from Zaneda Fernandez Gonzalez, a real woman that Casey, you know, used her name. So Zanny is short for Zaneda, not Xanax. So I get it. It was like a theory that Clint ran with. It picked up steam. But personally, I've never believed it. Does that mean it's not true? Does that mean it's not possible? Of course not. I don't know everything. I don't know it all. From what I do know about the case, from my process of going through this case for years, literally for years, over a decade, I don't think that it's true and I've never believed it, but it could be true. Two, something else I know about, about Clint. He appears in this docuseries to be sympathetic towards George Anthony. He appears to have also formed a relationship with George. So they show you this in the series to one, initially take away legitimacy from anything he says, because obviously now Clint has picked a side, the side of the man who Casey is alleging is responsible for not only, you know, raping her when she was a child, but now also what happened to Kaylee. So we can't trust Clint. But also, um, they're, they're doing this to show that, like, even someone like Clint House, who was so against believing that Casey could be innocent, who was so close to George, even he can come around at the end of the day and believe that Kaylee's case needs to be reopened and Casey, you know, may not be guilty. When in general, we still understand that if a person is presented with a one-sided narrative, if a person's presented with enough propaganda and they're weak-minded enough, they can be convinced of anything. And I think that Clint and Cameron are probably people that can be convinced of anything, especially when they're sitting in a room full of, you know, directors and production assistants and people who have you know, produced this biased piece of shit docu-series and they're all like, well, don't you think this is possible? Well, don't you think this is possible? And if you don't think this is possible, then, you know, you're against like hashtag believe all women. And if you don't think this is possible, then you are part of the problem. You're the patriarchy and you are a misogynist. 
they're going to be like faced with all of those people in this po- in this part of their lives when they're doing this series and they're going to come out of it being like, well, I, ca- I can't keep dying on this hill, man. This is going public. This is not the climate that that I can be successful in culturally and socially. So I need to, you know, change my tune. People do it all the time. But they use Clint House as an archetype. Uh, a stereotype of, of sorts, a stereotype of the kind of people who don't believe Casey. And they say, like, look, it's theories like Clint House's, the Zanny the nanny equals Xanax theory, that cause the rest of us to not believe Casey. And see how crazy his theory is? See how he doesn't even actually believe it himself anymore? They're using if-then logic without the actual logic part. And then Casey says, this has been a pattern, right? Cindy and George Anthony throwing her under the bus for money. And this is rich, man, because Casey has been the one using her child for money. So in my opinion, she's projecting. That's what she says in this series. Like, oh my God, I can't believe my parents are doing this. They've been, they've always done this to me. Like they just go and talk about me on these media shows and use me for money and and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that's what you're doing. So like, I'm not saying they're right for doing it, but you're doing that. So you're a hypocrite. You're projecting. Essentially want to, but she should be in jail because of Kaylee not being here. I want to think he doesn't have the power to hurt me anymore, but he still does. Ugh. And this was years ago, this interview. One of the money that he and my mother did separately and together for money. Money. You see how she looks up to see Throw me under the bus for money. Why? Why? Why exploit the situation any more than it has been? What? Okay, <laughs> Sissy. Is she for real? I lost everything the day I lost her. Aww. Everything. And it doesn't matter what I've done in between mm. in the life I try to live nope. and how good I try to be. Nope, doesn't matter. And every day I live with a broken heart. Oh, God, shut up. Oh, I mean, I am rarely at a loss for words. But there are no words, you know, for this audacity. But hold on, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to find the words. Why exploit the situation more than it has been? What are you doing right now as you're speaking to us, Casey, you moron? Where Where is Ashton Kutcher? Okay, where are the hidden cameras? Because we are being punked at this moment in time. Someone is playing the simulation of a video game that this life is, and they are drunk, and they are high, and they're just having fun with us at this point. If anyone watches this garbage, if anyone, if anyone believes Casey and fails to call her out on her hypocrisy, you are part of the problem, period. I guess I wasn't at a loss for words after all. The gall, the balls, the audacity of this woman to sit there on a Peacock series that she's getting paid for and say, why continue to exploit the situation more than it already has been? Why, Casey? Good question. Casey also has more why questions. Casey says, why? Why didn't my father... George Anthony called 911. I wasn't the only one home. Why didn't he do something? And why is he still blaming me for something I didn't do? And why, if you can ask, you know, why your father didn't call 911, why can't we ask why you didn't call 911? Why does that make us the asshole in the situation? You're the asshole in the situation, Casey. Hey, you're not gonna let me get this either of you. <laughs> I've never asked her about what occurred with Kaylee. And honestly, lady, that's why Casey still hangs out with you, because you buy her bullshit, because you don't ask her for the truth, because you don't ask her for details, because you let her live in her fantasy land. But hold on, I do want to go back to this clip, because there was something else there I got a big kick out of. I've never asked her about from loving, trusting, hilarious person that I know today. Listen to what Casey says. You're not going to let me get this either, are you? Oh, you're not going to get this either. I know. With Kaylee. Oh, no. What? You're going to pay for my groceries again? Oh, my God. Don't do it. No, no. Please. I mean, like, if you want to. (laughs) Casey says, you're not going to let me get this either, are you? Casey can't even pay for her own groceries, dude. And I think 
the docu-series people want us to perceive these interactions as everybody like Baby and Casey and doing everything for her. I think they want us to see this as Casey being so amazing, so wonderful, so kind that everyone just wants to bend over backwards for her and help her and give her a job and a free place to live and buy her food because she's just so incredible and she's been through so much and she's a victim. But that's not the way it comes off, at least not to me. It comes off looking like Casey's a leech, a parasite, an entity that cannot survive unless it's sucking the life out of something else. And she loves it. She loves it. She loves not having to lift a finger for herself. And it bothers me because this whole three episodes is very much colored by the producers as Casey's a victim of trauma. Casey's a victim of abuse. And so people have to do all of these things for her because how much she was hurt, you know, and how how much all of these things she went through, like, affected her. So now people have to take care of her. And what? What? First of all, I mean, I forget exactly how old Casey is. I think she's younger than me, but she's in her 30s, all right? She's in her 30s. I understand that you may have gone through some stuff as a kid. I understand even that maybe you never had the chance to grow up and maybe your your mental and emotional growth was stunted and maybe nobody ever taught you or told you how to take care of yourself. I understand all of that. But it is not the flex you think it is that as a 30-something-year-old woman, people need to take care of you still. It is not. It is not a good look. It does not look good. Even if you're a victim of abuse, even if you've been through things, it doesn't make you a compulsive liar like Casey. It doesn't make you incapable of taking care of yourself. I know many abuse victims, myself included, who have become wonderful, amazing, self-sufficient, independent, strong women. Okay, I don't like this, uh, this basically, you know, it's, it's, it's not, they're not coming right out and saying it, but it is suggested Casey's a victim. That means she's weak. That means she needs people to prop her up. That means she needs support and help. That is not necessarily what it means. We do need support and help. We need people to love us and care for us and, and you know be nice to us. We don't want to be re-abused, re-traumatized, but we don't need people to buy our fucking groceries for us, okay? We don't need that. We don't need people to just be like, leave Casey alone. You can't say anything about her this poor little girl and block us with their bullshit. Even Pat McKenna says he's never asked for details about what happened to Casey. And like, honestly, I don't know how the hell you can defend a woman in trial against these allegations that she murdered her child without asking for details. I don't get it. I don't get it. But I mean, maybe it's just me. I like to know everything about everything before I make a decision about it. I don't just take people's word for it when they have everything to lose. Maybe it's just me. I like the details, you know, whatever. But he's never asked her for um, the details about what happened to Kaylee. And then we have another creative animation that they pop in here to show how Casey, you know, she's just been compartmentalizing things her whole life. She's been putting things into boxes and pushing them on the shelf. And she's done doing that. She's done compartmentalizing. My father promised me that I could come home from this place. I'm remembering him coming and visiting me. I'm remembering him promising me that I would come home. I'm remembering him promise me that everything was going to be okay, that Kaylee was going to be okay. I'm remembering every fucking day that I spent here. I still need the same answers that I needed then. I need to know why all this happened in the first place and why he pinned it all on me. I walked into your room last night and just looked around and had a couple extra little prayers and just said, you know, you're coming home soon, sweetheart. Kaylee's going to be home soon, so we can be that that family again. So they show you this clip with a specific context that Casey is setting. My father knew where Kaylee was. He said she was going to be fine and we were going to be reunited. So they play this jailhouse visit. They show George Anthony saying, you know, Kaylee's going to be home soon. We're going to be a family again because they want you to believe that he was sending Casey like some message, you know, sit tight, keep on keeping on. I've got this covered and soon Kaylee will be back and you'll be out of here. You'll be free. Just trust in the process. 
but they, they are playing this out of context, right? They don't play the many conversations where Casey is saying the same thing that, that George Anthony is saying. They don't play the conversation where Cindy asked Casey, you know, do you know where Kaylee is? Like, do you have any idea? And Casey said, I don't know, Mom, but I feel like she's close by. I feel like we're going to find her. I feel like we're going to all be together again. It's suspicious when George says things like this, but not suspicious when Casey says things like this. Because don't forget. She's the victim. She's brainwashed. She was the brainwashed one. That's the only reason she's saying it. And because she's the victim, we cannot judge what she says or what she does. We can't. We can't We can't look at her negatively in any way. Now, Casey said that her father, to her face, was showing support, but he was telling the cops behind her back that she was a liar. And she was able to read his interviews with the cops after her grand jury indictment, which her father testified at, at the grand jury indictment. Now, watch this clip really quick, and then let's discuss. My father talked to your investigators. He talked to me at the car as I was at the end of the driveway. I noted in my report what he'd said. I interviewed George, and I remember him just going on and on about what a liar Casey was. Don't believe anything she tells you. It took me a while. I said, George, you, do you understand my role here? I'm, I'm trying to help your daughter. She's looking at death. I'll, you can't tr- believe anything she says. Yeah, my, my daughter lives on the edge. You know that from already quit lines. All the contradictions. My daughter takes things as far as she can take them. Everything that she's done, not only just recently, but going back months, doesn't happen in my mind. How come she's supposed to be one place and then she's someplace else? Where's my brain? I want to know this. So I'm confused, and hopefully you guys can help me unravel this. Is the narrative here that we're supposed to be mad at George Anthony or suspect him of murder because he told the cops the truth? Because objectively, Casey Anthony is a liar, and he said that she was a liar. That's the truth. And George Anthony was consistent with this, right? He said she was a liar when he was talking to the prosecution. He said she was a liar when he was talking to Casey's own legal team. He kept the same story. The only reason he seemed less confrontational when he was sitting in front of her is once again Because she was the one who had the answer to where Kaylee was. He wanted to find Kaylee. And he knew if he pissed Casey off or spooked her, she would shut down and not tell anyone. Similarly to the way Casey and her mother, Cindy, got into a huge fight on June 15th. And the next day, Casey drove away with Kaylee. And uh, and, and Kaylee never came back. Similar in the way Casey would withhold things. Similar in the way that Cindy Anthony, Casey's mother, would withhold her love, her affection. She would ice you out if you were doing something that she didn't like. Casey learned it from her mother, Cindy. And George, who lived with both of these women, knew very well how to handle them to get what he wanted. And I think this does really give us an indication of why. Why Casey is so angry at her father to the point where she would make these baseless, harmful, life life damaging, okay, I was going to say life changing, but life damaging accusations against him with no proof, by the way. She's so angry that he stopped enabling her, that he stopped pretending that she wasn't the blatant, lying con woman that we all know she is. Cindy Anthony, four years after, still publicly had Casey's back. Even when she said she was angry, she still said, you know, like maybe if Casey did do this, It was an accident. But George, he said the truth to the cops. He said out loud what he'd been living with for years. And Casey will never forgive him for that. She said that she was able to hear George's interviews with law enforcement after her indictment, the grand jury indictment, like I said, which George, you know, testified at. It happened on October 14th, 2008. So on on or around that date, Casey's known that George was telling the cops that she was a liar, that she would take things as far as she was allowed to take them. She says this in the series. She says, I was able to see what he was saying to the cops after my indictment. But then we see these jail visits where, you know, Casey claims her father was reassuring her that she was going to get out and Kaylee was coming home. And this was his way of letting her know to keep quiet. And he was working on it. And she believed him. After she read what he said about her in those interviews, she kept seeing him while she was in jail and believing him, even though she knew he was telling the cops behind her back that she was a liar. And she knew because he was telling Pat McKenna that, too. Are we supposed to believe that Casey didn't know what her father was saying behind her back this whole time? No, she knew. When you see her talking to him in jail, she knew what he was saying. 
okay? It's ludicrous for us to believe anything else. Casey knew. Casey was the one playing the game. Casey was the one trying to convince her father and her mother that everything was all right so they wouldn't, you know, push her for anything else. So that once again, more time could pass and the likelihood of Kaylee being found would get pushed away further and further. It's Casey who's playing the games here in these 911 calls because Casey knew what her father was saying about her and she still acted like she didn't. And she still is going to tell you that she believed him even though we know that she knew he was calling her a liar. Come on. And you know, Casey would like you to believe that she cut off contact with her parents and refused to see them for jail visits. And that's true. But what I guess she won't tell you, which you can easily find out for yourself if you just Google it, Casey didn't actually make this move until July, July of 2011, after her trial, after she was acquitted, because she didn't want to face them after the allegations she had made during her trial against them, against specifically George. She was mad at George Anthony for throwing her under the bus. She perceived it as an unforgivable indiscretion, and so she decided to throw him under the bus, knowing knowing very full well that they would never be able to come back from it, knowing that he would probably never forgive her for it and that they'd never be a family again. But as far as she was concerned, because she's twisted, because she's a narcissist, because she believes telling the truth about her was an indiscretion against her, as far as she's concerned, George threw the first punch. George attacked first. And so she was fine with literally uh, ruining his life, never speaking to him again, as long as it meant that she would be able to use him as a fall guy and get away with murder, allegedly. And if it meant that she could pay him back for his lack of loyalty, bonus. Bonus for her. What they don't tell you in this series is that George had plenty of proof that Casey was lying. It wasn't as if he was making this up. Even before Kaylee went missing, he knew that his daughter was a liar, and he even tried to convince Cindy about it. He went to this shoe store that Casey claimed she was working at, and he went there to, like, take her to lunch, and he walked in, and he's like, hey, is Casey here I'm here to take her lunch and they're like who's Casey who the hell is Casey we don't have anybody named Casey Anthony who works here this was a place that Casey was telling her parents she worked at where she was going every day while they watched Kaylee or while some random friend of hers watched Kaylee and didn't charge her for it because this friend felt bad for Casey because Casey is always just taken care of because she's been a perpetual victim forever and she's so great at manipulating people. She convinced a friend of hers to watch Kaylee for free while she went to work, even though she wasn't going to work. And when George told Cindy about this, Cindy got mad at him for checking up on Casey. Are you serious? George also knew that just a few days before Keely went missing, Casey was telling her friend Amy Hazinga that she was in the hospital because George had had a stroke. The police told him this during his interview, and he was stunned. He was like, what? No, I didn't have a stroke. This is bizarre. This is getting more and more unbelievable. His reaction to it was like, I mean, I know she lies, but... This is crazy. If George wasn't suspicious of Casey before talking to the police, he was during and after because they revealed all the things that she'd been lying about, which just added to the pile of things that he already knew she was lying about. Casey had told her friend Amy that her parents were getting a divorce and moving out of the house, and then Casey and Amy were going to live in the Anthony home together as roommates, and Amy was so certain of it. She literally changed her address legally because Casey said it was going to happen any day. She keeps putting Amy off. Amy's like, when are we moving in? Casey's like, oh, two days, this weekend, blah, blah, blah. And Amy's mail started going to the Anthony home. So Casey is good at manipulating people. If they're the right persuadable sort of personality, if they are convinced enough of her, you know, I'm a little lost doe in the woods. Please help me. Take care of me. Buy my groceries for me. People have been doing it forever. So why are we thinking that Casey suddenly lost this magic to manipulate people, to lie to people, to string people along for days, weeks, months, years? She's done it before all her life. Let's go back to June 16th, 2008, because they make a big deal in this series about the police only looking at Casey and not looking at anyone else, especially not George, who was one of the last people to see Kaylee. Well, it could be that the police didn't spend a lot of time pursuing this George kind of as a suspect theory, because the timeline, the actual timeline that shows that George claimed Casey and Kaylee left the house, and we know that Casey did leave the house because we see her cell phone records, which are pinging on towers. We see that she's driving around the neighborhood, basically waiting for her father to leave for work so that she could go back to the house and get back on the computer 
And why did she do this? Well, because she told her parents she had this important big job as an event planner at Universal Studios, so she had to pretend to be leaving to go to her job, but she didn't actually have anywhere to go until her boyfriend Tony finished up at college. He had classes that day. And uh, so he wasn't out of classes until four. So obviously, what's Casey going to do? She's going to be somewhere until she can go to Tony's because she can't take care of herself. So she waits for George to leave. So he thinks that she actually went to work. And then she just goes back to the house and hangs out there on the computer until she leaves to go to Tony's. So George Anthony's work records show that he worked from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. that day. That means he would leave probably around 2.30 p.m. to uh, go to go to work, to leave for work. Actually, I think he left a little earlier. Um, there's really just like allegations about the fact that he left earlier, but I believe this was his first week on this new job and he really needed this job. And so he wanted to make sure he didn't get caught in traffic, things like that. So he would leave uh, a little bit earlier than, you know, 2.30. But Casey, we know she spoke to her ex-boyfriend, Jesse Grund, at 2.52 p.m. And Jesse said that at this point during this phone conversation, he believed that he heard Kaylee in the background. So tell me, how? If Kaylee was alive at 2.52 p.m. and George Anthony was at work by 3 p.m., how could George Anthony be responsible for Kaylee's death? How could anything that Casey is claiming be possible? But once again, they won't tell you these facts in the series. They won't even bring them up to allow you the benefit of making your own decision and using your own brain to do so. They make it seem in this episode that the reason they didn't look at George was because he seemed like such a good guy. They literally in this episode say he was eliminated because he seemed like a good guy. That's not why he was eliminated. That's ridiculous. They said that the police were just manipulating manipulated by him. That's not what happened at all. And once again, I don't know how they can legally say these things. I do think they're going to get sued. George Anthony's alibi was checked because in the police records, it tells us what time George worked that day. Are we supposed to believe that the police were like, hey, George, what time did you work that day? And he was like 3 to 11. And they were like, that's all we need to know. Of course they checked on the alibi. And in this this episode, they got a couple police officers and they're like, well, did you pull his cell phone tower records? Did you you know, do this? Did you do that? And the police are like, I'm sure we did like back then, you know, I'm sure we checked his alibi back then, but like, I don't have a record of it, like at my fingertips right now. And then they play a uh, a clip of Yuri Malik, who was the head detective at that time. And he says like, no, we didn't pull George Anthony's cell phone tower records. We pulled his cell phone records, but we didn't pull his to see what towers he was pinging off of. Because at that point and at that time, and still now we do not believe that he was a suspect. We do not believe that he was responsible for this. So we have some other random people who come on and talk about Casey and, you know, how anybody who doesn't believe her, anybody who villainizes her is sexist and misogynistic. I'm not even going to respond to that. It's such a dumb and pitiful argument. You could literally say that about any woman then. No woman can ever do anything wrong. And if they do, demanding accountability makes you sexist and misogynist. Circular, stupid logic that leads nowhere. We can't say anything about Sherry Papini, who fabricated her own abduction, that's sexist. Can't talk about Lori Vallow, who took part in murdering her own children, that's misogynistic. Stop it, man. Now we get to the part in the episode where they're scratching the surface of the so-called evidence that George Anthony is the one who killed Kaylee, and it's so ridiculous. Places, when our family pets would die, dad, George, would wrap the puppy in a blanket, put it in a trash bag, and duct tape the trash bag, and we would bury the thing. Now, we are going nuts on the defense going, of course, George does that. And of course, this is how Kaylee's found in a trash bag with duct tape and wrapped in a blanket, the little Winnie the Pooh or whatever that came from the house. So we're like going, George has something to do with something. (laughs) What? I'll make it make sense. I mean, I feel like Pat McKenna is way too advanced in his years to be stretching this hard. Ease into it, Pat. You know, maybe go in the sauna first. Don't overextend yourself. This isn't this isn't great. They like try to make this connection between how Kaylee's remains were found and how George Anthony would bury the family pets. This is so stupid. This is a very common way that people bury their pets, first of all. You put them in a blanket or something that was meaningful to them, you know, that they loved snuggling up to in life. And then you put them in a bag and tape the bag so that hopefully your pet's body is preserved and the bugs don't get in there right away. Because it bothers you to think that an animal, a pet, a part of your family, 
that you loved, who was just alive, like recently, would be in the ground and have bugs crawling all over them right away. So yes, you wrap them up in a bag and then you tape it up so that nothing can get in, even though logically you know that you know these things are going to disintegrate and, and eventually ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's just something you do, okay? Secondly, do we think maybe Casey, having seen this process all of her life with her pets, could have been inspired by it, right? Just because that's what George did didn't mean that that's not what Casey did. Didn't mean that Casey couldn't follow those same steps herself. Isn't that how kids learn by watching their parents? We know that Casey learned to lie and be an asshole by watching her parents. So why wouldn't she learn how to bury things by watching her parents? This defense team has the balls to talk about junk science and crazy theories, and they're trotting out this garbage as evidence? Really? Then they talk about how George's memory was just too good on that morning. The morning he last saw his granddaughter, he remembered what she'd been wearing down to her socks. But if George hadn't been able to remember, you would have found that suspicious too, right? Because it was the last time that George saw his granddaughter Kaylee, he may have paid more attention. He could have a good memory for that sort of thing. I mean, he was a cop. Who knows? But for all the circumstantial evidence you cried about that went down in Casey's trial, George remembering what Kaylee was wearing isn't even circumstantial. It's just a reach. I um, saw my daughter for about five minutes this morning before I came down to record this video because she had just gotten dressed. And I could tell you what she's wearing because I gave her a kiss and I hugged her and I said, oh, you look so cute because little girls like to be told that they look cute. I remember what she's wearing down to her socks. Okay. It's just, I guess, something that some people have a good eye for. I don't know. I don't know why this this is their evidence. Like, his memory was too good. But I do know it doesn't really matter when it's placed next to the leaning tower of lies and evidence that we have against Casey. So then they start talking about the computer internet searches, the search for foolproof suffocation. And Casey said, listen, I don't know who did that. But it wasn't me. This was the home computer, and everyone had everyone's password. <laughs> oh, my God. What a liar. Play clip. It wasn't me. I can tell you that. Everyone had each other's passwords because it was a family computer. But I didn't make those searches. Do you think it's possible your dad did that 2.51 p.m. search if he was at work at 3? Where he worked and where our house was located was less than 10 minutes. Nope. There was enough time for him to have been home, still made those searches, and then left for work. Nope. At 3.02, we have George using his cell to call the house landline. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. But where was his phone pinging at that point? Was it pinging at work, or was it pinging closer to the house? We don't know, because we don't have George's cell phone records. That's also part of the problem. We don't have George's cell phone records. So what we do know is that George Anthony was working as a security guard at that time, and he that night was working a security event at the Fashion Square Mall. Now, the Anthony home was located at 4933 Hope Spring Drive. That's a 24-minute drive <laughs> from the Anthony home to the mall. It's only about nine miles away, but I guarantee you that George Anthony is not looking up foolproof suffocation on the home computer nine minutes before he has to clock in when it takes at least 20 minutes to drive to work. He cannot make it from his house to his job in nine minutes. I don't care what she says. And it once again blows my mind that she can just make these statements. I mean, maybe she meant it's like only 10 miles away. Is she, is she confused about miles and minutes and how they're different? Because it's only nine miles away, but it takes over 20 minutes to get there. And then in this uh, episode, they say, well, George called the house phone at 3.02 p.m. Casey, how do you answer that? Because they, they're trying to act like they're, they're doing some real investigative journalism here, some real hard-hitting questions. They're not, okay? They already knew how she was going to answer, and they already knew what they were asking. And Casey's like, yeah, but where did his phone ping from? Hmm? Hmm. And then they play the clip of Yuri Melik like, no, we didn't pull his cell phone pings because, you know, we don't think he's a suspect. So we didn't do that. But even without pulling his cell phone pings, I think we can still logically ask the question of why would George Anthony call the house if he was at the house? You know what else? Uh, starting at 3.03 p.m., Casey made six calls to her parents and the first was to her father. Uh, the last was at 4.24 p.m. and it was to her mother. Why would Casey call her father if he was at the house and she was also at the house because we know she was because she was on the computer she says it wasn't her but it was her because right after that foolproof suffocation uh like search somebody went on myspace casey's myspace so 
It just literally blows my mind that she's just making these statements and, and thinking nobody's going to fact check them or look into them because she's a victim. You know what else Casey doesn't say in this episode? Her father called her at 2.52 p.m. She didn't answer. He called her because he had already left for work. And there's a lot of evidence that George left early for work because this was a new job for him. Traffic at that time in Orlando could be tricky. He wanted to put his best face forward. So he left early because he didn't want to risk being late for work. And we know that Casey came back home shortly after 2, which is when the highest computer usage is seen on the Anthony home computer. George Anthony called Casey again at 3.04 p.m., and she once again ignored his call. He was calling her because she had been trying to call him. They act like it was George who was borrowing shovels from his neighbor in the days after Kaylee went missing, or that it was George who was pretending Kaylee was alive so no one was looking for her, or it was George who lied about talking to Kaylee on the phone so no one would think she was dead. This is insane. George didn't do any of that stuff. Casey did that stuff. George was not home at 2.52 p.m. when he had to work at 3 p.m. And his job is not nine minutes away from the Anthony home. These are lies. George Anthony was at work that day. His schedule was 3 to 11. And if he hadn't been on time or he'd been significantly late, somebody would have come forward by now and said that he wasn't at work or he was significantly late. And I have no doubt in my mind that the police checked that, you know, his alibi worked out and that he was actually at work at 3 p.m. in 2008. I have no doubt in my mind. I know that the police are not great, but I do know because I've seen the records. I've seen the reports. I've seen the investigative reports. They were incredibly, incredibly, incredibly thorough in this case, even checking all of these like uh, places that Casey said she was, places that she said Zanny was. I mean, they went all over the place looking for this woman, Zaneda, who they at one point figured, like, she's not real, she's not here, she doesn't exist, but they kept following those leads because they had to in order to later say, she lied here, she lied here, she lied here. So, yes, I have no doubt, 100 million percent in my mind, they checked to make sure that George Anthony was on time to work that day. So what does that leave us with? Casey is the one who does not have an alibi. But like Casey's OK Cupid dating profile said, live for the future, forget the past. Casey also says in this episode when she left her car in the parking lot of that check cashing place, she did so because she ran out of gas and she called her father and her father told her to leave her car there and he would pick it up. This is a lie. She said when she left the car, it smelled like garbage, not a dead body. Honestly, um, I, I'm getting agitated now. I ended up uh, watching this episode for the next 10 minutes or so and not even bothering to record anything or write anything down because it's literally all baseless claims. It's really easy to construct a timeline with your narrative when you have everything. First of all, you have the benefit of hindsight. You also have all the cell records, all the information, all the internet searches. It's easy to bend all of that to make it fit your version of events, especially when you're leaving out key points in the timeline. And keep in mind, all of this stuff that, that Casey's saying now, or a lot of it, it's like we've never heard this stuff before, that it was George Anthony who was like using the computer and it was George Anthony who was home. Like this is all stuff that she's saying now that she's, you know, had time to go over all of these records and say like, oh, well, here I can say he was here or here I can say he was here. But you're leaving out all the other like points that, that make your point invalid. We also don't know what was said on any of these phone calls. The existence, the mere existence of the, the presence of phone calls doesn't mean that what you say happened during those phone calls actually happened. So maybe Casey did speak to George on the day her car ran out of gas. But it doesn't mean that George was like, oh, your car ran out of gas and I still have your missing daughter. Like, don't worry, just leave it there. And then he made the car smell like a dead body. Like, is that what she's trying to suggest? She never comes out and says that. But she says, when I left my car, it didn't smell like a dead body. It smelled like garbage because I had garbage in my trunk. So are you saying that George went and planted the smell of a dead body in your car? I don't get it. And we have this like huge hullabaloo <laughs> that they spend way too much time on about how George was testifying against his daughter when he knew, when he knew she could get the death penalty. How could you do that to your own child? And how could you publicly say that you believed it was an accident when you were working behind the scenes to throw the book at Casey? He knew that his actions, his behavior, his words could potentially kill me. I can't imagine being used as a tool of the state 
to try to kill one of my children. Because you're delusional. He seemed fairly enthusiastic in that role. You're delusional. When George Anthony became the star witness for the state, when the goal of the state was to kill his daughter. I'm sad for you. He lost me. Ooh. He lost me right then. You lost me a long time ago, man. George was the star witness. Oh, and here's this guy. And he also was the star witness in front of the grand jury to make the indictment <laughs> what it was. So the real question is, if you were telling people behind the scenes it was an accident, would you testify as a star witness in a trial that would get your child death for that accident? I have to admit, what you just told me, and hearing that he was the grand jury star witness to try to get the death penalty for his own kid, I have never heard that before. Yo, this guy's and not... That's, he... that's shocking. Oh, you're... You're not a Why, reliable person. If you did think it was an accident, would you want the death penalty? Once again, this is a stupid, circular, straw man argument. Yes, Casey was George's daughter. She was a bad person, a compulsive liar. But I think we forget, or the series would like you to forget, that Kaylee was George's granddaughter. How could you do this to your daughter? Well, if you truly believed that your daughter had hurt your innocent baby granddaughter who you loved, why would you do anything else? It's the right thing to do, to tell the truth. George wasn't making things up. He wasn't saying, oh, by the way, guys, I saw Casey holding Kaylee's limp, lifeless, wet body. OK, now, if George Anthony was truly trying to frame Casey for this and he truly thought like these cops are going to believe whatever I say anyways, wouldn't he have done what she's doing to him now? What she did to him back in 2011 during her trial? Wouldn't he have told the police like, listen, I saw her. Um, I think it was an accident, but my granddaughter drowned in the pool because Casey wasn't watching her. And I saw Casey holding her body and then she left and I don't know what happened. When he just called the police that day, wouldn't he if he was really trying to frame her? I don't understand. Wouldn't he say things and make up things and lie about things if he was really trying to frame her and really wanted to make sure that she never saw the light of day again and that she was sent to like the electric chair or sent to death row? He didn't do any of that. She's the one lying and making things up about him. He didn't do any of that. He told them the truth. He said, listen, my daughter lies about everything. She will lie and she will take that lie as far as you let her. She's a liar. He didn't tell lies about her lying. So did all of these people want George to get up in front of the grand jury and lie? Did they want him to go under oath and lie like Cindy did about the chlorophyll allegedly? I'm sure that George at the end of the day wanted justice for Kaylee. And he was just doing his part, honestly. He was telling what he knew. Should he have lied and protected Casey? Would that in your eyes make him a better human being? Protecting his daughter and dishonoring his granddaughter's memory? Testifying against his own child probably wasn't the easy thing to do, but it was the right thing to do. And like I said, there was very little chance that Casey would have been actually put to death. She would have been on death row. She would have appealed. She would have appealed. She would have appealed. She would have wasted all our time and all our money. We know the stats from the last episode. We know the truth. Like I said, more people sitting on death row currently in Florida than have ever been executed in the history of Florida. And only two women ever in the history of the state of Florida have been executed. She probably would not have been put to death. We know the truth. They're wasting our time. And this freaking guy, Clint House, man, Tony Lazaro's old roommate, I don't even think he knows where he is at this point when we get closer to the end of episode three. He's the one who came up with that whole stupid Xanax theory that, that he wanted us to believe that everyone in this documentary wanted us to believe was ludicrous earlier. But now at the end, he's presented as the voice of reason somehow. He's presented as somebody who's like, wait, I mean, George knew his daughter could you know, go on death row and he still testified against her? Like, that makes me feel uncomfortable. What kind of person would do that? Maybe I should second guess what I already think I know. Hmm, come on. These people really think we are idiots, man. So I'm just going to put us all out of our misery and skip to the part where Casey makes her big revelation, uh, which is something that her father said at Kaylee's funeral about missing the smell of Kaylee's sweet sweat. I remember my father said something during the course of my case. I don't remember if it was in an interview or who he said it to. I'm pretty sure it was actually public. 
but he said he used to love the sweet smell of Kaylee's sweat. Casey, he said that at Kaylee's funeral. <laughs> Was it really? Of course he did. Of course he did. What better way to memorialize your granddaughter than to tell the world that you were abusing her too? What? what? <laughs> Where did you get that? I, I need a minute. Sorry. Oh my God. First of all, uh, Casey's totally misrepresented what George actually said, so let me play the actual clip for you. And so many of you that never got a chance to actually hug her, smell her hair, smell the sweet sweat when she came in from outside. To hear her call me Jojo. Sure, I was grandpa, but I was Jojo to her. Some days when I wouldn't maybe just pay attention to her for just a second, she would get right in my face and, Jojo, Grandpa, Grandpa Jojo, George, she knew me. She knew how to push me to smile at her and hug her. I miss that kiss on the cheek, that special hug that I tell everyone it's so great to get a hug from someone. But to get a hug from a small child, that gives me energy like you couldn't imagine. George said that he missed the smell of Kaylee's sweet sweat when she came in from playing outside. How is in the world, how in the world is that George telling everyone that he abused Kaylee? What are you talking about, man? He didn't say, oh, I miss the smell of, of Kaylee's sweet sweat when I was abusing her. He didn't say that. He said when she came in from playing outside. Now, granted, our perception of what George Anthony said is colored by the fact that, you know, he is kind of creepy. We kind of don't trust him, like, all the way, you know, because everyone in that family was very damaged. But, I mean, it, you've never been a parent if you think that generally those comments are odd. Smelling your children, I know for me, smelling my children is so natural. It's primal. It's how animals and humans form bonds. It's completely normal. It's like, smell is so attached to memory. It's not even funny. If you think that this statement is odd, <laughs> you are not ready to hear what Madeline McCann's mother wrote about her in a book, okay? So if you think that that statement's odd, I don't ever want to hear from anybody that Madeline McCann's parents are innocent and have nothing to do with what happened to their daughter. Um, yeah, it's, it's not really a super odd statement to make. George's statement was perfectly innocent. But also, when Casey has spent the last like five or six hours of this series painting him as a child molester and then playing this clip, yeah, like if you didn't know better, it would feel super, super icky. But listen, I've said similar stuff about my own kids, and I promise you um, I'm not uh, a child molester. I just, you know, love my kids, and I love kids, and I think that they're amazing, and, you know, they do smell great. Kids smell great even when they're, like, sweaty. They just have... Um, they, I'm not, I'm fucking getting creepy now, aren't I? Let's move on. So after that clip that I played for you, Casey cried loudly off of camera for, like, two minutes. It was annoying, like... There's no reason to keep the camera rolling for that. The only reason you're keeping the camera rolling is so that we're aware of how distraught she is. But, like, why does she have to go off camera to do it? And why did you keep that in? Like, I understand if you kept rolling, but in the editing bay, you'd think at that point it'd be like, well, why do we have to just show an empty chair and play audio of Casey crying for two minutes? Well, because we want people to know how upset she is, how much of a victim she is. Poor, poor, poor Casey. And then finally, Casey comes back. And she's like, okay, I'm going to tell you what happened. But then she doesn't. She doesn't. She, no she never tells us what happened. She starts talking about Zanny the Nanny. And she said, oh, I made this woman up for the times that I wanted to be with my friends. But also I wanted my daughter with me because I didn't want to leave her with my parents. So I told my mom, Cindy, that Kaylee was with a nanny. Well, that doesn't make any sense, Casey. Why wouldn't you just say, like, I'm going to hang out with my friends and I'm bringing my daughter with me? Don't you think that your mom would be happier that that Kaylee was with you rather than with some random nanny who you said was a friend of yours who she didn't know and had never met? 
Why wouldn't you just say she was with you? You're a liar. You're a liar. And then uh, Casey says after June 16th, it was George who told her to keep lying about Zanny. He said, just tell the cops what you told your mom. That's what Casey claimed he said. He, she said he wanted her to be the biggest and best liar there ever was. I, I literally, I can't do this shit with her anymore. She's taking no accountability, not even for her lies. She's blaming everything on George with zero evidence to do that. So let's just zip to the part where she blames him for Kaylee's death. Can you take her away to abuse her? That's the darkest question, isn't it? This is so hard. I live with that guilt of feeling like I failed her and didn't keep her safe and protect her. I've always wanted the truth because I've lived so long without it. But I don't know if I can handle all of it. I don't know if it would be better to know or just keep not knowing. Because I don't know what the truth is. All I know is that she's that something happened. You don't know the truth? Wait, what have we been sitting here for three episodes for? You don't know what the truth is? What? So did you hear the producer, whoever the hell is talking in the background, did you hear the producer say, did he take Kaylee away to abuse her? Once again, am I missing something? Was George Anthony mysteriously MIA for those 31 days? Even a portion of them? While he was holding Kaylee at some undisclosed location so that he could go there and abuse her? Is there any evidence of that? Because last time I checked, the autopsy and the medical examiner estimated that Kaylee was dead very shortly after she went missing, most likely that same day, June 16th. And didn't you say, Kaylee, that you held her limp and lifeless body that day? Am I freaking missing something? Did he take her away to abuse her? Why is this even a question that's allowed to be asked? Is that a theory now? Because they don't ever explore it anymore, okay? The cold, lifeless body in the swimming pool is not part of the narrative anymore. I'm so confused. Please help me. Oh, wait. They then go on to say that the pool was just a cover-up to conceal whatever George had done to Kaylee. So he must have, like, killed her and then put her in the pool so that she would look wet and look as if she had drowned These people, man, these intelligent and successful people like Pat McKenna, they can't actually believe this shit, right? They can't. We never discussed this, but when he abused you, was there anything that he did that you would make you think he did that to Kaylee to cause the accident? Absolutely. If I didn't want to or if I said no, (sighs) he'd put a pillow over my face and he'd smother me to knock me out. That That happens several times. Can you take a pillow into your face? That could be the accident. Uh, what? Possible. <laughs> he abused her to stop noises and grab a pillow, and that would be the accident. Jesus Christ. Wow. <laughs> yes, comfort her. She's forever the victim. Forever. So, yeah, they make these claims, you know, Casey's like, yeah, he could have suffocated her to death. You know, they could have he could have suffocated uh, Kaylee while he was abusing her and then accidentally, you know, killed her. I mean, I, once again, I don't know what happened, so I can't say that this didn't happen. But Casey also says that George Anthony did this to her for several years, right, between the ages of 8 and 12. George Anthony would sometimes put a pillow over her face to suffocate her. And he never accidentally killed you. So if either George Anthony is like adept with this method or he's like a a bumbling fool and doesn't know how to properly suffocate somebody without killing them, like which is it? Did he do it to you for years or was this his first attempt and that's why it failed? So after they they say like, um, you know, this huge like, oh, maybe that's what happened. This is followed by a black screen with the words, George Anthony didn't reply when asked about the allegations in the program. He has previously denied having anything to do with Kaylee's death or abusing Casey. He is not believed to have publicly addressed the allegation of abusing Kaylee. He has not been charged. <laughs> So the conclusion to all of this is they have no proof. There's nothing new to share that we didn't know in 2008 or even in 2011. And Casey doesn't know what happened, but she thinks that maybe George Anthony killed Kaylee while Casey was napping in the morning because he held a pillow over Kaylee's head as he was molesting her. And whether he suffocated her accidentally or on purpose, we don't know. But Casey and Pat McKenna are sure that George had something to do with it, even though... 
Once again, there's no evidence of that. Should I make that point again, or should we just leave it for the lawsuit that George Anthony is hopefully going to file against everyone involved in this shit show? Here's Casey's final thoughts, and then I'll give you mine. They protected her abuser. And that crushes me. I can't let that go. I'm never going to have full closure. And the irony for me is I think that's part of the reason why people are still so hooked on this is because they feel they need closure. That's not why. That's not why. It's it's like watching these reality shows or, or watching a movie and you feel like you need to have this ending, but it's not the ending that you want. Are you ever going to have that sense of closure? What? what? I didn't get the ending that I wanted because I didn't get my kid back. Oh my. That's the only ending I wanted. <laughs> That's the one thing I will never get out of all of this. You're lying. Yeah. It's been hard to cope. Not easier, harder. Oh. So waking up every day and wishing that some days I would wake up and look over and she'd be right there. Oh. Sweet little kid. We're done. We're done. Goodbye. 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 That all Casey. this is just the shittiest bad dream. You're the shittiest bad person. You are that for me. We all talk about all the things that we have in a lifetime, and I had the shortest life with her. 525,600 minutes. The quality of your voice as you speak to me now is completely different than the beginning. I also just feel like I'm in a state of trying to patch up the bleeding, just like I was completely spliced open and everything just okay. came out. All right, we're all done with you. Honestly, I think I've said everything I need to. When Casey's car was taken into custody, they found a Dora the Explorer book bag, Kaylee's favorite doll, a change of clothes for Kaylee, and a toothbrush. It was Kaylee's overnight bag, the one George Anthony saw her leaving the house with, because according to Casey, Kaylee was spending the night at Sandy's. It was a bag that I believe Casey handed her daughter to bring out to the car so that this story would be more believable because she wanted people to to believe that Kaylee was okay. She had an interest in setting the stage. I think it's very hard for us to understand why, why Casey would be sitting in front of these cameras crying her eyes out and making these very serious allegations if they weren't true. Uh, I guess my only answer to that is people will do a lot to save their own skin. And I advise everyone to not think too much about the mind of Casey Anthony, to not spend too much time trying to put yourself in her shoes, in her head, <laughs> and wonder what aspects of her behavior are normal and or sincere, if any. It's an exercise in futility. I can tell you that I would never make these kinds of allegations on a television show if they weren't true, especially about my own father. But I can also tell you that I wouldn't allow my child to be out of my sight for over a month without doing anything about it. That The whole point is Casey's not right, man. There's something deeply and irreparably broken in her. And I don't really care how she got that way. I just wanted to see a shred of self-respect, a shred of humanity, a shred of accountability throughout any of these three episodes. One moment of self-awareness. That's all I wanted. And she's failed on all fronts. The evidence is all out there. It's publicly available if you want to go through it. There's depositions, toxicology reports, investigation evidence reports, cell phone and internet history records, chloroform and odor analysis, psychiatric reports. Everything is there. You can look through it. And I promise you, you will not think that she's a victim or innocent at the end of the day. And about a week ago, uh, Vox posted an article online called Why We're Relitigating the Casey Anthony Case Now and Why We Shouldn't. And I think it was a pretty good summary. I'll link that in the description box as well as the videos I've done in this case if you're new to it and you want a good place to start. But believing Casey now after all this time, after all the lies that didn't work, that didn't land, that didn't pan out, that couldn't be supported by evidence, it's just a really bad idea. Casey thinks she's real slick. She thinks she finally found the story that no one can call her out on. This is her truth, after all. And people are understandably uncomfortable questioning women about their past abuse, their past trauma. But Casey doesn't realize that, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, she's exempt from the respect and benefit of the doubt that I would give to most other people who are making the same claims as she is. And it has nothing to do with her being female. It's not my internalized misogyny. If Scott Peterson popped up tomorrow and said, hey, I lied and I did horrible things because my family abused me when I was little, I wouldn't believe him either because like Casey, Scott did come from a messed up family, but he's also a known, repeated, habitual liar. And so you've lost the trust of the public. You've lost the ability 
for me to take anything that you say at face value. Some people will use George Anthony's silence against him. They'll say, well, this guy's clearly guilty because he can't or doesn't want to respond. He can't or doesn't want to defend himself against these allegations. But he's already defended himself against these allegations because they aren't new. He denied them back in 2011. He denies them now. At this point, if he engages, he's just feeding the troll that Casey Anthony has become. She loves the attention. She loves the spotlight. She loves being at the center of it all. And so she'll do whatever it takes to stay there, including probably hoping that her father sues her and then she can paint herself as the victim again. Now, one of the jurors on Casey's trial said he's been haunted by the decision to acquit her. And after watching the Peacock series, he said, quote, her story just changes all the time. This isn't what we heard in court. This wasn't her defense. This is something different. Not completely different, but different enough, end quote. Different enough as if it was modified to reflect the current climate, to reflect, you know, the current allegations. Yeah, it's different enough. This juror said that it made him sick to his stomach when he watched the part of this episode where the verdict was read and Casey, you know, was smirking. He said it made him sick to know he was partly responsible for her walking free. Now, during the Peacock series, Casey literally said that she does not believe Kaylee drowned in the pool. She said, quote, there was no ladder, no way for her to shimmy up. There's no way to explain that unless George put her in the pool to cover up what he did, end quote. According to People magazine, this stunned this juror who said, quote, the entire defense was that Kaylee drowned in the pool, but now she's saying that she didn't drown in the pool? So the entire defense was a lie? Either that or she's lying now. Who can tell for sure? This is classic Casey Anthony. She's still lying after all these years and once a liar, always a liar. End quote. Exactly. Exactly. Either she was lying then or she's lying now. And I mean, just the fact that we have to question when she was lying puts her in a light where I don't believe anything she says. And I have my theories and my suspicions, but as I said, I don't know how Kaylee died or why her life was taken. But I do wholeheartedly believe her mother was responsible and you'll never change my mind. At the end of the day, as disgusted and disappointed in Casey Anthony as I am, I'm also encouraged, very encouraged by all of you out there. And I think if it's possible for Kaylee Anthony to, you know, be out there somewhere watching all of this unfold, she's so happy and so proud that in the world she has gained hundreds and thousands of moms and dads and sisters and brothers and grandparents, people like me, people like you who have been truly torn apart since we heard her name and saw her face for the first time, who realized and recognized what a beautiful and bright light she was, and who mourn her every day with the respect and the care that she deserves. I appreciate all of you for that. I thank you for that. And I ask you to never stop because this has all been for Kaylee. These last three videos They were for her, and they were for the people who, even for one second, felt themselves pitying Casey Anthony. The person you need to feel sorry for, she's not here anymore. She's gone. Her name was Kaylee. She loved books. She loved Winnie the Pooh. Her favorite color was purple. She was incredibly sweet and affectionate. She loved to swim in the pool. She would stay in for hours if you let her, and she loved playing in her little house in the backyard, and now she's gone, and there's no reason or explanation, or dramatic retelling that makes that okay, or that makes that hurt less. And I see that Casey Anthony wears a lot of evil eye jewelry. I've noticed over these past three episodes, she's got a lot of evil eye jewelry on. And and it's probably a smart move, honestly, because there's not a lot of people out here who are wishing her well, as it should be. And you, Casey, you should have had the good sense in your head once you got acquitted to suck up all the charity that the schmucks around you have showered on you since the moment you were born and live a quiet life, stay silent, and stay invisible. Do not show your face again. Go get a notebook, get a journal, get a different therapist for every day of the fucking week if you must. But please save your lies for your diary and save your tears for the people that you pay to listen to you. Leave the rest of us alone. You have smeared your daughter's name more than enough at this point. Thank you guys all for being here. Don't forget to let me know what you think about everything that we've talked about these last three videos in the comments. Also, hit the like button if you like this video. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already because there's a lot of you watching who aren't subscribed. And follow me on social media, Instagram and Twitter. The links are in the description box. Also, you'll find a link in the description box for my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with retired police detective Derek Levasseur. You can find us on YouTube. You can also find us wherever you 
you get your audio podcasts. Additionally, Derek and I have a coffee company called Criminal Coffee Company. It is the best coffee on the face of the earth, although now Casey Anthony will probably go and buy it and do a review on it and say it isn't good to just, you know, get back at me. Or maybe she'll say that my coffee somehow um, molested her or hurt her or triggered her so that she can be victimized by my coffee company and, and try to get back at me because that's the only way that Casey knows how to handle, you know, someone who doesn't like her, someone who doesn't believe her, somebody who thinks and talks negatively about her. She just knows how to lash out and then make baseless, empty, and uh, proofless allegations against them. <laughs> but anyways, check out my coffee company, Criminal Coffee Company, the best coffee company in the entire world. So good. It's criminal. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. Yeah.